Buongiorno. Hello. I'm Frederick Ilchman. I'm the chairman of Save Venice, the American nonprofit dedicated to restoring art and architecture in Venice, Italy. And it's been a tough month for news, but finally, we have some good news to share with you. Our speaker today is Melissa Kahn. She's been working for Save Venice for 31 years, virtually all of that in Venice. She became director of the Venice office nearly 20 years ago and has deeper experience than anyone I know about art restoration in Italy, specifically in Venice. After a month of not much news, she's able to report directly to you uh, and really make clear how much is going on. It's a quite encouraging report. So, Melissa Kahn. Hello and greetings from Venice. Um, I'm speaking to you from the Save Venice office in Palazzo Contarini Polignac that you see here on your screen. Um, this week, Italy entered phase two of coronavirus and our work sites are slowly reopening, taking into consideration uh, the new norms and the distancing between workers, the wearing of masks and gloves. Um, today, I'll be highlighting our restoration projects now. Um, I certainly don't have time to talk about everything that we have underway but it'll give you an idea of what's moving forward and what to expect in the coming months. I'll start with Torcello. Um, you know, as we know, Torcello uh, in the Venetian Lagoon, about a 45 minute boat ride from Venice. Uh, this is the oldest um, standing uh, monument in Venice and the building itself dates to the seventh century. As we see the interior of Santa Maria Assunta, um, we can keep in mind that, say, Venice has several projects there. Most important is our anniversary project. And the anniversary project involves the two of the apps of, of the church. We have the central apse with the uh, Madonna Hodegitria, and we expect to be putting scaffolding up in the main part of right here um, within at the beginning of the summer so that we can um, do a, an additional conservation check on the mosaic and then start the actual conservation of the mosaic and also of the, um, the brick choir underneath in the surrounding area. What we do have moving forward right now with scaffolding already up is the apse that's to the south of that, the right apse, uh, called the diaconicon apse. Um, the term diaconicon is an old term from Eastern or Orthodox churches meaning the area south of the central apse of the church. And this was where this, the um, vestments and books and holy objects were kept. And that name has um, been retained in Torcello and it's now called the Diaconicon Apse. You can see here is our scaffolding cover that when you go to the church, you see the image of the mosaic. And in the whole photograph of the mosaic, you see these little dots, uh, which in the, up the, larger version, you can see that they're actually stickers that the conservator has put uh, during his conservation studies. And these are areas where there's damage and they'll be the first area where intervention is required. We'll also be working outside of the Church of the Apse at the same time. Here you see the scaffolding behind the Diaconicon Apse in a photo from a board visit in February. And we'll be extending that scaffolding into the area of the Apse as well. And you can see here in the area of the, the mosaic of the Madonna. It's essential that we work on the exterior of the church at the same time as the interior of the church because any movement on the outer walls can affect the mosaic and you have to make sure that they're secure in place and work simultaneously inside and out. So we're very encouraged because the work site opened up again on Monday and uh, the workers are already uh, beginning on the next phase and um, Torcello will be an ideal work site for this summer being able to move along quite well. As in addition to the apps projects, we also have the project in memory of John Julius Norwich. And here you see the iconostasis where we completed the work on the marble elements last summer. And this is actually a very good photographic reproduction that's up in the church because the 13 panel paintings that you see below are in a conservation lab. And um, we have a photograph where our projects committee was visiting the lab and where they were seeing the backs of the panels being shown by the conservator. So this conservation will take uh, about another year because the, the panel paintings have to be straightened out and adapt to their surroundings and then work on the integration. 
So we're hoping to have a, a commemoration probably next summer. And it's a project that we're doing along with Venice and Peril. Um, on Torcello, we just completed last week the uh, Geo Raider studies of the floor. And this um, is a way of telling how stable that floor actually is. It's a ground penetrating radar that has a high frequency radio wave sent through the floor. And then you can determine if there are problems underneath. And what we have here are the various um, sort of the results of the various problems with the floor. And this is all part of our immediate response fund. It's funds that we had raised um, to help monuments that were affected by the high waters of November and December. And here in the results, the blue was sort of the most dire situation, uh, but most likely um, resulting in old drainage systems or channels that are underneath the floor, where the yellow uh, is simply a detachment in, a, in the mortar between the uh, mosaic pieces or the marble pieces of the floor. And um, the orange is a signs of sort of empty pockets. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that all these are actually empty. And, and next week we'll be on Torcello uh, with a sonar and checking some of the cracks and trying to, uh, to see down through the floor to determine if the subfloor has shifted or not. And right here you see the machine that's used to do the Diorado, a very small machine connected to a computer. Our second big anniversary project is in the ghetto of Venice and we're working on the Italian synagogue, known in, in Venice as the Scuola Italiana. Uh, it's a building that was founded, the synagogue was founded in 1571 by the Italian speaking community of, of, of the ghetto. Um, and they wanted to worship in Italian and in Hebrew and in the Italicum rite, which was different from the Ashkenazi or the Sephardic. And we've already done testing inside the to see the decorative elements of the synagogue. And you can see some of the results that we have here. We have um, in this area, the brown paint has covered a full marble area and um, they actually would have been painted in gray. And here you see the under results are actually, uh, it's white underneath this blue. And here are the many, many layers of paint that show you how many times uh, that, that this and the, the columns have been repainted. Work will be resume in the ghetto uh, this summer. Uh, it's part of a much larger project that the Jewish community is doing that also in includes the Jewish Museum. And the synagogue will then be part of the tour of the Jewish Museum. It's been closed for many, many years. Of course, San Sebastiano is always um, a very important project for Save Venice, and particularly as it is a plague saint, and most of the uh, artworks are dedicated to healing and overcoming great physical difficulty. Uh, it's a magic moment in San Sebastiano because there's no scaffolding, as you can see from this photograph with the recently completed side chapels. But what we're working on next um, are the chapels in the front and particularly the Lando Chapel, which is here you see in an old archival photograph, um, the Lando Chapel had a tile floor with 384 Maiolica tiles dated from 1520 that were taken to the church by the Lando family when they acquired the chapel in the 1540s. And these tiles have been in storage uh, since the early 1990s. And only this November, uh, through negotiations between the Cadoro Museum that had them in storage and the Catholic Diocese, we were able to get the tiles back. And now they are in a conservation lab uh, where you see they've been studied and we're putting together conservation plans with the hope that they can be restored and taken back to the church and put down in some way where people wouldn't be walking on them, but they uh, will once again be part of the decorative cycle of the church. Here, of course, is the church of the Frari. And if you go today, when you walk in the church, this is what you see. We have an amazing uh, scaffolding covering. This is actually not the painting, but it's a reproduction that covers the uh, immense scaffolding where the conservation of the Assumption of the Virgin and its monumental frame takes place. You can see we have a double scaffolding because we're working on the frame of one set of cons conservators and also on the painting. The frame has been quite amazing. Um, it's a, an enormous work that was completely filthy from all the accumulation of smoke and dirt through the years, as you can see from this test cleaning, the cleaning patch that was left, the, how, how dark it was, opposed to the, the Istrian stone and the gilding. 
And we've also been able to recover in the spandrels, which is this area above the painting, uh, angels that are painted directly on the stonework, possibly by Titian himself. Um, on top of the altar, there are uh, three figures of saints and Christ. This picture was what the Church of the Far used as their Easter greetings this year. Very proud that they could finally show a beautiful picture of Christ uh, that's attributed to the Brenya workshop. You can see how dark it was before uh, we started conservation. Uh, so dark, turned out, from all the soot and this, the, the accumulation of, of smoke, that at one point we were concerned that possibly it was supposed to be look, to look like faux bronze, that maybe this was an intentional dark treatment that had been added to the stonework. And instead, through uh, testing and, and chemical analysis of this dirt, it proved to be strictly um, smoke and grime. And so it has been removed, and you see the beautiful figure of Christ with the gilding and the polychrome. We also, at the Frari, have, excuse me, and the next at the Frari, uh, of course, we're still working at, on the assumption. And here you have a better view of the type of scaffolding we have, which is sort of a window washer type scaffolding that rises up and down in the area uh, behind the altar. We've pushed the painting back about two meters and so that the painting did not have to go to another location in the church. And these are some of the results right now that's going on with cleaning. You can see where the varnish and the sort of the patina from an earlier restoration has been removed and you see the much lighter tone. And also with the figure of the angel, just the clarity of the skin tones and not the overall yellow and darkness that the painting had suffered from. Another work that say Venice is doing in the Frari is the, um, the altar of San Saint Catherine by Palma del Giovane. It's an altar that nobody paid much attention to, the painting and the altar, uh, just because it was so dark and seemed kind of nondescript. We've taken it to the conservation space within the church, and you can see in this picture with no light on it, it's particularly dark, but during cleaning, uh, the results have really been phenomenal. And here you can tell with the uh, blue of St. Catherine's robe, and this is the area still covered with varnish. So you're in, in a half and half situation where this side has been cleaned and this side has just had a, a surface cleaning. So this painting will be uh, an incredible addition to the Frari and uh, really be something for, to reconsider Palma Ogelvini's work as this being um, perhaps uh, reconsidered as one of his best. Here you can see the detail of St. Catherine's face with the varnish on one side and what's been removed to see the, the delicate skin tones. In the academia galleries, a very important polyptych of Santa Chiara by Paolo Veneziano. And that painting has been moved to the Misericordia Restoration Lab where the painting was, the polyptych was taken apart. So the frame was separated from the panels. And you can see the individual panels here undergoing conservation. Another very important painting from the academia undergoing treatment in the restoration lab, the Misericordia, which is um, under the auspices of the, of the Academia Galleries, is the Carpaccio Miracle of the True Cross, um, which was taken, deinstalled from the Academia. As you can see, we're taking it off the wall, uh, putting it down on the floor where the stretcher is removed. So it can be rolled, put on a boat, and taken across town to the Restoration Lab. Um, the Miracle of the True Cross is part of the series that was in the, the Scuola of San Giovanni Evangelista. And here you see another very well-known painting by Gentile Bellini that's part of the same cycle, that's in the same room with the true cross. In the conservation lab, we just started, this picked up in January and February and should resume again when, um, by the end of May, where you have certain uh, restoration uh, patches where we've opened up and taken off some of the varnish. And you can see the different in the sky, in the figures and also in the water. I mean, this certainly looks very matte because all the varnish has been removed, but it's a certain beginning steps to see that this will be a very promising conservation. Continuing with Carpaccio, we're working in the Scuola Dalmata di San Giorgio di Schiavone, and the facade was restored years ago by our California chapter, 
and we're going ahead with the cycle of nine ca narrative canvases by Carpaccio. Um, the first one we're working on is the calling of St. Matthew, and here you can see where the painting was taken down and what it looked like before conservation. Valentina Piavan is the conservator that's been working on the piece, and here you can see where most of the damage is, which is um, between where the two pieces of canvas were stitched together. And in this picture, you can see that she's taken off all the varnish, the in painting, and the plaster fills, and down to the actual um, canvas where, where most of the damage is more evident. Here you can see the painting after, nearly after conservation, there's still a few more things to be done. Uh, and we see how this painting is going to, this painting and the rest of the ones in the Scuola Dalmata will once again take on the true color tones that Carpaccio has, uh, much more similar to the St. Ursula cycle that Seven has restored in the academia. The next painting that's up for conservation in the Scuola Dalmata is St. Augustine in his study. And in this photograph, you can see where we've taken off just a bit of varnish in this area, the remarkable difference of floor here on the wall. And then also in this area, again, a bit more damaged, where this yellow, sort of yellow patina that was added during a, a restoration in 1950 is being taken off. So conservation there will begin again next week and uh, on through the summer, and then we'll be able to continue with the rest of the cycle over the next two years. A new painting we've added to our repertoire is the St. Mark's Lion, dated to 1516, in Palazzo Ducale. And this is a newly adopted project uh, that is still available for sponsorship. And we're very happy to be able to do this, this work, um, very iconic. Uh, this is really the St. Venice symbol, the Lion of San Marco. And it should make a big difference uh, for the clarity and the various problems the painting has suffered through the years. Another painting in Palazzo Ducale, which is, um, will resume once Palazzo Ducale can reopen, uh, should be after the 18th of May, is the Boccaccio Boccaccino, Madonna and Child in the Inquisitor's Room. And in this photograph, uh, you can see it uh, before restoration, again with the yellow overtones, and then after it's been cleaned, the varnish removed, where it's more evident the problems that it has, this break in the panel, it's a wooden panel, which will be addressed and work will be done also on the back. So that conservation will be moving forward. In the Church of San Marziale, uh, we have a very interesting project, but the church now is probably best known for its painting by Tintoretto that went to Washington for the Tintoretto exhibition at the National Gallery, which you see in this photograph. But what more than this Tintoretto painting, what's actually been most important for the church is this image of the a Madonna and child. It's a wooden sculpture from the late 13th century. Um, the painting, the sculpture was taken down and is now in a conservation site in the church. Uh, but what's really interesting about this is that the whole church, basically the decorative cycle, all pays tribute to this particular statue. Um, there are actually, the story is that it arrived in Venice, miraculously had been sculpted by angels, and arrived by boat um, from Rimini on the west coast of Italy, the east coast, sorry, the east coast of Italy, and came to the Church of San Marzale. And here we have a publication from 1507 that tells this story, and also a 16th century painting in the sacristy showing the Madonna arriving. Um, this decoration continues all about that particular sculpture when you have on the altar, you have an altar front showing it arriving by boat, and also paintings on the ceiling in, in very poor condition by Sebastiano Ricci telling the story of this Madonna. Here you see in conservation um, much closer what a really truly beautiful work of art. And scholars have been working on um, this particular image and similar sculpted images from the 13th century and have determined that it, it doesn't come from Rimini. It seems to be, again, late the 13th century, so fitting the date of 1286 that the church claims it arrived in, in Venice, but probably comes from a, an unknown sculptor from the Val d'Aosta on the eastern, uh, the western coast, uh, western side of Italy, up in the mountains between France and Switzerland. So there seem to be a group of these sculptures around Italy 
that all come from uh, the same area and scholars are working to, to further identify it. And so the piece from San Marziale also is part of that, that um, artist's work. Um, there's interesting with this sculpture is that they've determined that the front piece, the bodice, was actually added in the 1500s. And while the conservator is working on it, she's able to determine that it's a, a cork insert that was uh, it placed perhaps to make modernize the, the, the dress of the, of the Virgin Mary. Um, and underneath you can see still um, the original belt and the coloring that was on the bodice underneath. So it's a very unusual situation where the, the modification was done to change the dress style. This brings us back to an old Save Venice project um, from, the, um, from the 1980s. It was uh, called the Spanish Madonna in the Church of San Francisco La Vina. And it has a very curious story that it was in San Francisco La Vina, but before that in the Church of Santa Justina, and before that uh, in Crete, uh, in the Venetian colony of Candia. And during the conservation, uh, they took off all the overpaint, it was no longer a, uh, a black Madonna, and instead it was taken back to the sort of pure wood form, which made scholars realize that it's also connected with San Marziale piece. And um, the fact that it also comes from the same area of Val d'Aosta from the Piedmont. Uh, there must have been many of these pieces that were sent all over Italy or all over the world. So it sort of makes sense that the piece ended up in, in a Venetian colony and then ends up coming back to Venice and turns out to be a companion from our San Marziale Madonna. I think toward the end of my um, presentation, we'll go to the island of San Giorgio. And here we have uh, what's considered uh, one of Jacopo Tintoretto's last works done uh, in very strong collaboration with his son Domenico. Um, this painting was taken down and taken to Washington to the Tinneret Exhibition. And we did a sort of a brief maintenance on the painting so it could travel. But we knew when, that it still had problems. And when, we came, when it came back to Venice, there would be more work to be done. And so here you see uh, the underdrawing evident in the, in the x-ray, where you see um, this very quick, quick work of Domenico Tintoretto with probably the inspiration from Jacopo, uh, done really the year before Jacopo died. And here you have the test cleaning areas where you can see uh, the various solvents, the decisions of what's needed to remove the varnish and dirt. Here's an area where a larger spot where the varnish and um, discoloration has been removed. And you can see that this will indeed be a, a very beautiful piece uh, by the Tintoretto family workshop. I really um, have to mention the immediate response fund from Aqua Alta. Uh, that's something that say Venice has been working on since November. And we have now $700,000 raised for 22 sites. And now this spring, the major concentration is on the Church of San Donato, where the church, you can see in the photograph, was underwater for a considerable amount of time during the flooding. And now, since January and February, and now just resumed on mon last Monday, uh, work continues on the, on the mosaic floor. And here you can see photographs from yesterday, uh, where the workers working with the new um, physical distancing between workers and uh, with masks and, uh, and the right equipment are again moving forward to complete the conservation of the floor. So I wanted to end my lecture with a, a lovely shot of the Academia Bridge that I took yesterday. And Venice is basically slowly opening up again. And our Save Venice Conservation Projects are, um, are a very important part of this. Uh, these projects not only provide a livelihood for conservators and artisans and restoration professionals who have faced economic difficulties during the coronavirus shutdowns, but they also provide, ins provide inspiration and a sense of community, collaboration, and international solidarity, showing that art matters and that preserving the world's artistic patrimony and remembering the past can make the future somewhat brighter. Thank you. So thanks again. Thank you, Melissa. 
So thank you very much. That was a, this is Frederick now, and I really enjoyed uh, that. I think any talk that includes uh, Tintoretto slides is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So thank you. It's a uh, very inspir inspiring, particularly to know the range of projects, the immediate response fund alone, uh, 22 sites across Venice uh, to spend down uh, money raised specifically for the high water uh, damage and protecting against future floods. I also appreciated how many recent slides you had. I would encourage people uh, who would like to comment on these, uh, on any of these projects or ask a question. Uh, we have a nice, uh, there's the feature here on Zoom, the q and It's a box probably along the bottom of your screen. Click on that and you can type a question and uh, Melissa will answer it. And or you can make a comment. And on, in addition, um, if we have a lot of questions, we might uh, not be able to get to all of them, but I promise uh, we will follow up afterwards. So one question I had, Melissa, maybe, is could you talk a little bit about how the protocols for art restoration have changed a little bit, uh, perhaps since the November floods? Um, as we know, Italy is a country that has lots of officials and paperwork and such, uh, certain time consuming aspects to getting uh, permission to undertake a restoration or a renovation. Uh, how have things changed since November, particularly related to the immediate response fund? Uh, well, there is um, an article in the, the cultural heritage authorization, which is for emergency work. And so after the floods, many of the projects fit into that emergency category, meaning that uh, they were sort of streamlined, the projects and the authorization so that work could start immediately. And that's what we were able to do on Murano uh, starting in January when we realized how the situation was so difficult and were able to move a lot quicker. Um, these projects from, from Aqua Alta are all priority projects. And so that's why even now when things have slowed down to shutdowns, they're first in line to move forward and, and very important that Venice, um, having suffered so much in November and December, and again, uh, along with the rest of the world this spring, uh, we're ready to get up and moving again and, and be prepared in time for next year's Aqua Alta season. Great, thank you. And a, a, another um, one, uh, you're, you were trying to cover a lot of ground and uh, do it relatively quickly, but which of these do you find personally uh, most appealing? Uh, I'm interested in this because there is so much going on, a whole range of projects, and of course you couldn't see any of them in person for more than a month. So what were you missing when you were outside of Venice? Actually two months that we didn't um, see projects. So because things closed down on uh, the 8th of March, and so just remote and two months later. I think Morano San Donato was a project that I was very, very much involved with in January and February. And then uh, that was the first work site that I visited uh, yesterday. And I'll be back out again next week uh, because we have such, such a collaboration with uh, the church authorities, the priests, the conservators, the project directors. You know, it's a real team, almost a family. And so to be able to get back to working on Morano and San Donato with the mosaic floor, uh, we feel like you're really make, making a difference and something of great importance. Here, here. I, that's, I know what you mean. Uh, so one question uh, we had just a minute ago from, from Charles uh, Tolbert was one, wondering if you could talk more a bit just anecdotally about life in Venice. Uh, what's it like for your family, uh, colleagues, your neighbors, and what is the projections for things opening up in the next few weeks? Thank you. It's a good question. Um, okay, so the first things that started to open on Monday the 4th were the work sites, things that were already construction sites, so not just conservation. Um, and necessary workers and any work related offices, um, you could travel to your office if you had a real motive for work. That's why the St. Venice office is partially open. Uh, although the, the Roseanne Library is still closed because libraries cannot open. March 18th is the next deadline, let's say, uh, where museums are hoping to reopen. And by the beginning of June, it should be restaurants and more um, shops, uh, merchandise, clothing stores of that type. Uh, there's hope to slowly ease into the reopening because we don't want um, too many people to be out and about risking infection, but uh, it should prove so far that with precautions, with masks and physical distancing, 
and hand washing that hopefully the Venice, uh, where there are not that many cases right now, it's actually a very positive uh, sort of area of the Veneto that will be able to continue and move forward throughout this through the summer. So I have to say, Melissa, that there's quite a stream of comments and compliments uh, for your update and people are so gratified that things are going forward and you have so much good news to share. I mean, just visualizing all the places you are going to in your talk, you really cover uh, so much of the broader city of Venice and in fact reflects really well on say Venice's geographical reach. Uh, so here's a question. Uh, one person was wondering, how do you think from your point of view, the Venice uh, point of view, how has the funding or our ability to raise money been affected by COVID-19? And how are we sort of um, dealing under the circumstances? Um, I mean, this is new territory for us. So certainly not being able to have the New York ball in April um, creates a change of a funding source that we had expected, but we certainly have high hopes that that, that fundraiser can take place the end of October. Um, we have received funding. We received money for the for the um, immediate response fund and other donations that people have been inspired by uh, the photographs on Instagram or the news of the reopenings that I think our core uh, Venice donors uh, will remain and continue to fund. And we'll just be looking uh, for other ways to inspire people and to make them remember with great fondness Venice and and prove you know, how important the activities of Save Venice are. Well, I, I totally agree. Um, it, someone who tries to get to Venice at least once or twice a year, it's poignant to think that I might not do so uh, for the rest of, of this year. Uh, at the same time, lots of great memories. And I do say that Save Venice's uh, new website, lots of beautiful photography on there. And uh, it's maybe the next best thing. Uh, no, I suppose the next best thing is to hear directly from you live in Venice uh, in, in your office under the roof of Palazzo uh, Contenini or Polignac. Uh, where you can uh, re really bring up to date us uh, with things you've just observed or conversations you're having. Um, would you say overall, though, Melissa, that the conservation operations for the, all the various Save Venice projects, the Immediate Response Fund, plus the ongoing ones, the ones that predated last November, are we at 50% under operation, a little more than half, or where are we now? Um, no, I mean, basically all of them can start up. It's just that this week we've had a few that were already ready, the sort of bigger work sites, and then individual conservators that are working offsite are, are sort of upgrading their facilities if they need to uh, to make more space for their workers. We're waiting at the Misericordia Lab to open be, where the academia has their restorations because it depends on the academia museum. So I would say um, by June we should be completely up and running and including uh, the large scale work in the Venetian ghetto because they're planning on assigning uh, the contract to the, the to the restoration firm in May 15th. And so the, with the intention to work moving forward, it's a good time to work because there aren't as many people around. So you don't have to worry about your scaffolding blocking the central apse mosaic or Torcello, or if the Jewish museum ends up being closed more often work can move forward on say Venice's project on the ground floor and we'll also be to work in the synagogue. So we're basically um, making the best of a bad situation and using this quiet time to try to get as much work done as possible. Thank you, that's very encouraging. And uh, uh, I can imagine that you're really raring to go. Uh, you can do a certain amount remotely, but remember as we care, say Venice cares for precious works of art and architecture, you really have to be there uh, to ensure it's uh, careful conservation and its long-term survival. So thank you very much, Melissa. Live to us from Venice, we appreciate so much uh, your attention, your hard work, and making a difference over there. Bye-bye. Thank you.